All right. Should be able to get the videos up there starting this weekend. It doesn't take too long. I got the software I need and the like. So let's see if that's working out. Will there be a link on Angel? Huh? Will there be a link on Angel? It's like uh, the yeah. iTunes spot? Yeah, it'll link to the iTunes spot. Oh. Did you get a satisfactory answer to your question? I'm sure my answer wasn't satisfactory. Well, I don't understand but I think I actually did it right in the first place. You did it right, yeah. But um, I just looked at the numbers and was like, oh, geez, that just does not make sense. Yeah, yeah. but there's, uh, this is the problem where it tells you to find uh, some spot between the sun and the earth where the gravitational attraction is the same either way, uh, where the, the two gravitational attractions cancel each other. So there's, there's some spot here where though the Earth is much smaller, if you're a lot closer to it, you'll have a gravitational attraction that's balanced by the gravitational attraction of the Sun. And you would solved the problem. And uh, did everybody see his post on Angel? No? I explained why nobody jumped in to help. He solved the problem and then said, but this can't be right because why aren't we floating then at that spot? Why aren't we at that spot where we're not attracted to the earth any more than we're attracted to the sun? Or why isn't at least something floating at that spot? I'm just saying that the numbers are really close to the distance to the earth, to the sun. But I forgot the whole 10 times 10 to the 11. There's actually like 260,000 kilometers. Yeah, it's it's it's. I it's, it's really close, but yeah, this isn't a scale lines. drawing, by the way. It's it's somewhere off of the Earth's surface that that point is. But but your your main part of your question was why aren't we there then? Why is why don't we float at that spot? Or why couldn't we put something there and it just sits there? Or why isn't there? Uh, a bunch of star junk there, you know, coffee cups and other stuff that the astronauts have been throwing out of the space station. Is that spot so exact? No, no. There, there is indeed a spot between uh, the Earth and the Sun where there's zero gravitational attraction to either one. Because Earth is in orbit around the Sun. Earth is in orbit around the Sun. Don't forget. And what is required for any object to go in a circle, circular path? Centripetal acceleration. centripetal acceleration. We have centripetal acceleration here as supplied by our gravitational attraction to the sun. So that's what keeps us in a circular orbit. If there was something at this point where there's no net force, in either direction, much less towards the center of the circle, whatever's right there at that that spot of zero gravitational, zero net gravitational attraction, whatever's right there wouldn't stay there. Because very shortly later the Earth would move to some other spot and there'd be no reason for that object to follow it and certainly wouldn't follow it, maybe if, even if it has a net veloc uh, some velocity of its own, if there's no net force on it at that time, it's going to go in a straight line, not in a circular path. It would not follow and stay at that same spot. However, there is a spot a little bit closer into the sun than that spot is, where there is some net gravitational attraction left over. So I'll draw it a little bit more. That's that's more attraction to the sun because we'll say it's a it, it's a little bit closer than the original spot we were talking about. Maybe that's back there, where the the net gravitational attraction to the sun is sufficient for that circular orbit as centripetal force. And something can be placed 
right there in orbit, if it has an appropriate velocity for that orbit, remember that there's a balance necessary between the force, the velocity, and the radius of the circle. F equals N, F equals M times V squared over R. It's got, you got to have that right balance. There is a place where the net force is balanced if you have the right velocity for that radius of orbit and something between the Earth and the Sun will stay there. That's not where the satellites are because the satellites orbit the Earth. But there is a satellite there that's very useful for uh, being a solar observatory because there's never anything between it and the sun. It will always work. It's called um, SOHO, Solar Observatory Helios, and I don't know what. Go, go Google it. Uh, this spot is called a Lagrangian spot. This is known as Lagrange 1, L1. And that's what I put in your note. I said that there is such a spot. That's, the, that's one of the spots they're talking about. There's another one over here on the other side of the sun where the attraction to the earth, well, the attraction to the earth would be very tiny. It's so far away, but the attraction to the sun is just right for it to stay in an orbit and uh, will always be opposite the Earth. So it's a, it's a satellite we'd never see and never be able to communicate with. So no sense putting one there. However, if you need a place to hide, that'd be a great one. Uh, and there's also three other Lagrangian points. I think, uh, I think there's also one here. So we got a little bit more gravitational attraction to the Earth a little bit less to the sun, but it's just enough to be just right for an orbit that always stays. Oh, that that satellite would never see the sun, so solar panels wouldn't be necessary. And then there's two more that are um, <coughs> off to the side here, uh, and. The, uh, I believe the gravitational attraction of the moon comes into that one as well. So there's five Lagrangian points where uh, an object put there at that radius orbit with the appropriate velocity. Remember, for a circular orbit, you need a velocity that's always perpendicular to the force, the centripetal force. There's five spots where you could put something there and it would stay there. And then you could say, why aren't we floating there? Well, we, we could. You could be the first astronaut to go live there. All right. So watch Angel for homework questions and answers to help each other, especially since I understand that you're finding some of these challenging. Just a lot of them. Is that it? But it's, so it's only this first chapter that had more than I think three on any one day. But that's because all the rest are impossibly hard to do. So. What'd you say, Pat? <laughs> I know Bobby would never say anything. All right. Any other questions? Okay. On. Uh, Gosh, Monday. Monday, this is where we were. We've established uh, a couple things so far. Uh, the, the very first part of it was, was nothing new. We established that uh, uh, velocity is the time rate of change of the position. Remember, we're working in rectilinear motion. Straight line or one-dimensional motion. These are uh, what, with what we're starting with, 
things can either go only left or right, or they can only go up or down, or whatever direction, but there's no possibility of taking a corner of any kind, at least in what we're establishing uh, to start with. And that's why I don't have any vector signs on here like we would have had uh, by, by uh, uh, a little bit later in the physics one term. All we need here to establish different direction is a plus or a minus sign and some agreement to some convention what the plus and what the minus means. Usually, we'll take something like... Uh, plus to be in the right direction, minus to be in the left, plus to be up, minus to be down, unless we want to say something else. We just, it just has to be something we all agree on. Uh, but that's all we're looking at for right now. We won't be there for very long. In fact, if you look at the schedule, Monday we start with curvilinear motion. We're done with rectilinear motion. So we had this. Also decided that uh, maybe that's just too much for us to write, so we can sh do a shorthand business of uh, just calling it S dot. Not very useful in rectilinear motion, but it will be in 2D and 3D motion when we have motion in different directions. And we can illustrate that with this notation uh, and keep them separate. We can then talk about x motion and uh, velocity in the x direction and keep it separate from the velocity in the y direction and even the z direction if we want to. So it'll be very useful once we get into other dimensions to use that dot notation. Uh, we also have that acceleration was the time rate of change of the velocity. So we can also use the dot notation on there. And we can even take it a step farther because the velocity itself was a time rate of change, a time derivative, which gives us other possibilities for the notation uh, and the flexibility that those provide. Uh, there's no universal, I, I can't say, uncategorically that one is better than the other at all times. There are times when it's a lot easier just to use V instead of S dot. But there are going to be times when using the dot and the double dot notation uh, can have some advantage to them. Um, then we also discussed three possible situations three possible uh, problems that we could look at where either the acceleration is a function of time and then we discussed with that. We'll, I'll, I'll review those real quick here in a second. Uh, what do we do with that kind of problem to find out what's going on with the velocity and the position? A could be a function of position itself which is pretty much how you live your lives whether or not you accelerate in your car is determined pretty much about by, by where you are. If you're near a stop sign, you're going to be decelerating. Once you've stopped there, complete full wheel stop, fellas, then you're going to accelerate from there. How hard and how long you accelerate may depend upon what else lays up the road. Is there, is there a corner coming up? Is there traffic? Do you need to make a turn? Whatever it is. And then the last possibility that we looked at was that acceleration was a function of velocity. So we looked at those three cases. Uh, and we'll take them a step farther right now as we, as we review what we got from them. So for this first case, we got it down to the point where delta V um, which, remember, is the change in the velocity. We could always get, if we got the area under, the uh, AT curve, which is what presumably we have in some measure here. 
maybe it's a, a, an approximate data taken curve, or maybe we actually have a function and we can graph it and have the curve, or just integrate it. Either way is the same to us. But we knew if we had the acceleration as a function of time, whatever that might look like, we could find the change in velocity between any two of the same uh, time points if we could either integrate the curve uh, numerically, just do the integration if we know that a function or an approximation of that function, or you can always integrate by counting up the little squares underneath. The, sort of the, a sort of a brute force way to integrate if you need to. And we knew that the area under that curve would represent the change in velocity between those two time periods. How do we handle the fact that in this illustration, part of the integration is below the t-axis. What does that represent? What does that mean? Velocity is zero? Nope. Remember, the area tells us only something about delta v. So if we have a negative area, as we would if we did this integration, no matter what method you do an integration below the axis, you get a negative area. If you get a negative area, you have a negative delta V. In other words, the object for that portion would be, do we, what'd you say? Slowing down. Slowing down. Area above the axis is a positive delta V area below the axis is a negative delta V. Bless you. Uh, if we're numerically integrating, that just gets handled. You might not even see that. But if you're graphically integrating, actually measuring the areas, you have to remember that we do have such a thing as negative areas. So uh, graphically, that looked like Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, numerically that, that looks like that, mathematically it looks like that. We have the possibility, of course, that A is a constant. In that case, we can do this integration. In fact, we can do it almost instantly, and we get that. As the first of our old friend, friends, the constant acceleration equations. So, Frank, you're at a bit of a disadvantage. Everybody here, well, DJ, you, I don't think you did either, had me for physics one. You didn't have me. So you and Frank and DJ are at a disadvantage because everybody here, oh, Pat didn't either. God darn. So, uh, anyway, in physics one, as we got all the physics one, all the constant acceleration equations, every one of my students every year has always gone out and gotten those tattooed somewhere. They're that useful. Um, so they might share them with you sometime. Uh, what, what tattoo artist you used in town, they've got to be pretty good at those equations by now. So, so you, you can go get the uh, appropriate tattoo of these. Uh, Constant acceleration equations. What newbie? So we'll get you for free if you feel that way. I'll do it for you. <laughs> we we were thinking of getting uh, I'm glad we didn't invest in the tattoo stuff now that Andrew's gone. That would have been a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, then we looked at case two. Let's see if 
okay if I'm going to be able to slip it in here in this narrow area. Yeah. Case two, if you remember, the starting with the uh, assumption that whatever we know about acceleration is uh, uh, dependent upon position, we got that down to VdV equals a ds in differential form. If we want to, we can write it as uh, s dot ds dot s double dot ds. Uh, this is one, uh, students tend to forget that this is available a lot because this is not something that we've necessarily seen. Uh, certainly haven't seen it very often. So we integrated that to see if we do indeed have the acceleration as a function of position, what it might tell us. So whatever that function might look like, if we integrate this equation between two points, then the area under there, the area under that function gave us what? Remember? Gave us what? Change in position. Louder. Change in position? Not quite. The change in velocity. This is the change in position right here. Just right off that axis. Gave us what? So the change in velocity stuff. Not directly. It could lead to it, but what did it give us directly? If we had that area, what was it we had? One half delta V squared. One half change in the quantity V squared. From that, we can get the change in velocity. So if we had the area under this particular curve, that's what we get directly from that area. Don't forget delta V squared quantity is not the same as delta V quantity squared. So be careful with that. Um, what it looked like I guess was, uh, let's see, V2 squared equals V1 squared plus one half integral a ds s1 to s2. Okay, same thing. Um, there it is mathematically. There it is graphically. Same business. Then again, we have the special case possibility that a could be a constant. If it is, it's an easy integral to do. It comes right out of the integral. We integrate ds. That's delta s. We have v2 squared equals v1 squared plus one half. Sorry, something's wrong. It's not one half. I don't know where I got that. Oh yeah, I do know where I got it. Because uh, this one half will come over, so this is actually two. Two a delta s. And there's the second of our constant acceleration equations. That came from case two. We can do something else with case two just to give us another tool in all of this. Remember what we're trying to be able to do is solve any of these accelerated motion equations we can come across, whether the acceleration is constant or whether it's not. Most of our time in physics one was constant acceleration. We'll do some of that, but uh, we won't do exclusively of that. All right, so uh, there's another way to look at, at um, this uh, 
case two that we had there. Let's rearrange things a little bit. I'm going to take the same differential form we have there and just do it like this. Which is no big deal. Remember, um, what we're looking at is uh, what happens if A is a constant. Let me return that here. Actually, we can do this even if it isn't, but what we're going to do next requires that it be a constant. So we can integrate this S1 to S2, integrate across V, V1 to V2. Of course, this left hand side is nothing but delta S. The right hand side integrates, remember here A is a constant, it can come out of the integral. We're then integrating V dV, which we already did over here anyway, it's just we had to leave the A where it was in that instance. Now we're doing the A equals a constant instance. And so that integrates to uh, one half V squared between the limits of V1 and V2. Well, that's no more than we did there. There's nothing really new yet. Well, other than A is a constant. Uh, but to get something new, if, if I took this any farther, we just get that and it's no use to us. We don't have anything new. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to, let's see, let's let V2 uh, v squared, V2. Let's let V2 equal V1 plus the amount that the velocity changes in a time delta T plus A delta T. Essentially what we've got here is this is V1 plus delta V. That little bit there, that little tail there, that's nothing than, oh, what I had down here, and we just raised a second, that's just A equals delta V over delta T. So I'm going to put that in there and do this integration. So I get 1 over 2A. Between the limits of V1 and V1 plus A delta T. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and put that in. We got 1 over 2A. Put in the top limit, so I have this quantity squared as the first limit. So I'll work that out as we go. That's V1 squared. Remember, the, we're, gonna, we're squaring this business here, so we'll, uh, we'll do FOIL on it, but we'll do it a little bit faster than that, plus 2V1A delta T, that's the middle term. So I have that squared, plus those times itself twice, plus that squared, plus A squared, delta t squared. Did I do that right? That's the top limit of the integration put into our result of the integration. And then we subtract from it the bottom limit put in, which is just minus v1 squared. Everybody all right? Okay, a couple things we notice. One, uh, we have V1 squared minus V1 squared, so that cancels. With what we're left over, we have A on the bottom and an A in each term. So that A cancels that one, cancels the squared. Remember, we couldn't have done that if we still had V1 left over in there, but uh, those cancel each other. So we're left with, let's see, delta S equals one half 
Um, a delta t squared plus this one half cancels that two. We get v one delta t. And you will also recognize that as one of the constant acceleration equations. I hope. If you don't, check your tattoo. If you don't have one, check somebody else's. Then go get one. Don't come in in the first exam without your constant acceleration tattoo. Right, Colin? Probably even referred to it a couple times over Christmas. Okay, I think that that they should make it mandatory when you're driving a car that they project on the on the windshield with you know some light shining up there so you always see it the constant acceleration but you always keep them in mind. And when do you do more accelerating than when you're in the car? Alright, so that's three constant acceleration equations. Guys and gals, how many are there? Huh? There's four. So the fourth one, fourth one isn't really anything we derive, but it is something we have to keep in mind. And that's that anytime we have A equals a constant, then delta V over delta T is also constant. Because A equals delta V over delta T. So, of course, that's true. If we then look at what's happening when somebody something is accelerating with constant acceleration, well, of course, it's going to be a straight line. It could be negative, could be flat, could be down. Uh, or positive like I drew it, but I have to draw something, so it's just arbitrary what I drew. Then remember, whatever velocity we start with, V1, and whatever velocity we finish with, V2, the average velocity is simply the arithmetical average of those two numbers because it's a straight line in between them. The average. Because it's a straight line in between those two, the midpoint is halfway in between. How eloquent is that? And don't forget, though, that the average velocity is delta S over delta T. And so there is our fourth constant acceleration equation. Anytime you have a constant acceleration problem, those four equations are at your disposal. Every time. Be careful, though. Students very often try to apply these when we don't have a constant acceleration problem. And they don't work. But this is a much brighter group than that group. Right. Uh, any questions there before I clear the board and we do some other stuff? Such as, just for reminders, we'll do a constant acceleration problem. A simple one here. We got. Uh, let's see. Here's here's the here's the town limit, and I'm trying to establish something about a, a legal jurisdiction over this automobile problem. So we need to know exactly where everything was happening in this problem. So we're going to need to find. Uh, where object 
some object, some, uh, well, we'll put a car here. Let's use my car. I like it when we use my car for something. There we go. That's my car. Frank, if you look out the window, you'll see my car in the parking lot. There it is right there. Initial velocity. Fifteen meters per second. We're doing a constant acceleration problem here to start with, and that uh, acceleration is four meters per second squared. All right, so the first, first question we want to find is uh, find the distance traveled in two seconds. So two seconds beyond that initial spot, 500 meters. Find how much distance was traveled in that time. All right, now, um, Frank, DJ, and Pat, we boiled this down in Physics 1 to a, a, a very straightforward way to solve all these problems. The trouble is I just gave you four constant acceleration equations. One of them works. Three of them don't. And the problem is how do you figure out which one of the three, which one of the four you keep and use? I always thought it was kind of like, almost like magic when I, when I saw the, the problem solved in the book. They always said, use this equation. They never said how they figured out to use that equation. So in physics one, we were able to boil it down to a way that we could instantly and accurately decide which of the four equations to use at all times. Is that right, boys and girl? We did just that. It goes like this. I'll give it to you to you real quick for your digestion. And then I'll even give you a sheet of the constant acceleration equations that they all had. That's what they took down to the tattoo parlor and had put. It was up to them where. Every constant acceleration equation uh, problem has only five possible variables in it. There's only five things that can come up in any one of these problems. Five possible variables. No constant acceleration problem will have any other variables but these five. Well, there might be a slight form difference, but basically these are the five variables possible. Of course, acceleration is a constant acceleration problem. It might be part of the problem, as it is in this one. There, A equals. Um, also, the initial velocity, like we've got here, it could be part of the problem. The final velocity might be part of the problem. We, we don't have it here, and it wasn't asked for, but it could have been. It's also possible we're talking about how much distance was traveled in these problems. We are asked find that. And a certain amount of time goes by in all these problems. No constant acceleration problem can ask you anything other than one of those five, or ask, that can deal with anything more than those five things. Maybe you're given x1 and you're supposed to find x2, but we just condense that down to delta x. It's always the same. Five possible variables. Then what, old students of mine? What do you look for? Our problem is only going to involve four of those. One of them is left out, just because of the way the problem is written. We don't have in this problem any given or asked for V2. 
So only four variables are important. In our case, A, V1, delta X, and delta T. Didn't ask anything about V2 and it wasn't given. So it's not part of the problem. Go back now to the four constant acceleration equations I just gave you. I don't have them on the board. I have one on the board, but I don't have the others. Go back to those four. Only one of them has these four variables in it. All of the others have a V2 in it. There's the equation you use. Works every time, doesn't it? Only one of the equations has those four, none of them. Three are given. One is not. It's unknown. And that's the one you're supposed to find, and you just use that equation to find it. Works every time. What equation is that? That's the one, uh, I think it's the one we had just before that. Delta x equals one half a delta t squared plus b1 delta t. In fact, uh, we don't even have to do anything with it. It's all right there in its proper uh, algebraic form, and we just plug and chug and finish up. Make sure your units are okay. Meters, meters, seconds, seconds. Yeah, everything's fine. You can just plug it in and solve for it. No sense even bothering with any of the other equations because they have V2 in them. When you plug that in, what do you get? <coughs> get who? 38 meters. 30, 38 meters? Really? How come I have 240 meters? <coughs> No, no, it's, it's 240 meters extra. That's 30. That, that could be 240. Oh, well, it's better than what I had written down first, which was 118,000 meters, 118 kilometers. That's you guys driving. You could go that far in two seconds. I couldn't. So it's, what, 38 meters? All right, so then the police can say, well, the that's out of our jurisdiction. Uh, we'll have to let Sheriff Buford down the road handle this one. As if Sheriff, as if anybody can catch that car, can't happen. All right, uh, just one more step of practice. Find um, find the position x. when the speed is 25 meters per second. Once again, four things are involved. Three things given, one thing not. which equation to use, the other three equations won't work.
Is that a question, Jake? Yeah, we don't know the time. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, we still have A, same acceleration. We still know that it was going a certain velocity, V1. We're given, uh, what is this? Yeah, this in this case, we, we can call V2. Uh, maybe you want to call it V3 just to separate it from whatever V2 was in here, but it never came up, so might as well not belabor it. And then, uh, what's the fourth variable? Now, we don't have this in there yet. We want to find out how far it went. You have to pay attention, is this X is measured from the town line or is this X additional or what? Uh, but those are, those are details. Those are just details to how we solve it. So, three are given and one is not. So only one equation is gonna work. Did it work? Frank, isn't that a beautiful method to make it simple? Yeah. Yeah. Don't you wish you had me for physics one? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember who you had? Uh, yeah. At, uh, Gamble area. That was at Clarkson, right? Uh, no. No? It's at, uh, I think it was uh, Oh. Was that, oh, that was high school physics. Yeah. But you took college physics. Because that wasn't, was that calculus based? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. So did that, that work as college credit? Yeah. But how come I had you again? Uh, the, the, oh, the, the counselors did that. Um, yeah, see. The counselors, you tell them physics and calculus, and their eyes roll back in their head and things start spinning around they start getting like this and they have to go lie down in the back and then during that time they're they're having a vision of what class you should be in and it has no reality to it so so that's we try to tell them please don't counsel the engineering students please send them down to us and they won't do it so we're gonna have to edit that part out all right so only one equation works which one is it Huh? V2 squared equals V1 squared plus 2A. In this case, we're using delta X, not delta S. Um, that's the only equation that has those four things in it. The time is not a factor in this problem, in the second part of the problem. It's a different time. Maybe it's asked later, but it's not asked now. And so you get what for delta x? 50 meters? Let's see. Please, God, let us agree on that one. Yeah, 50 meters. 50 meters. Now, if in any of these problems you are asked for the one variable that's missing as a second part to it, then what equation do you use? I just have a question. Hang on, let's answer the question. If for a second part we weren't asked to find something entirely different, what if we were asked to find what's the velocity after two seconds, then which equation do you use? Well, we a more general answer for my physics one students. Because now all five variables are part of the problem. Because we just found the we just found one of the missing ones, in this case it happened to be delta x. Then if it asks for what's the velocity at that point, now all five pro all five variables are part of the problem. That means all four equations. Could, well, actually, the other three could work because they're the ones that had V2 in them. Which one of the three do you use? Whichever one you want. Whichever one you want. Because all three of them are going to give the same answer. Which use, which, use the easiest one. 
you don't want to, for example, uh, if you're looking for the time, solve the quadratic in this form if you don't have to in one of the other forms because there's just uh, there's hazards in doing the quadratic equation on, on the fly. Is it better to use the one where you didn't find, just find the answer? Like use only the one that you have the given score already, that way it can be a mistake when you found your when you found delta well, x, if you made a mistake and you used that mistake and you delta x into one of the equations, you'd be wrong twice? Uh, well, if I understood your question, if, if, we, if we solved this, and then as a second part had to find the velocity at the same time, then find v2, you can't use the same equation. No, not the same one. I mean, you use a different equation, but only with the knowns that you have. Not oh, the, I see. Not the found oh, OK. Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. That or do it right in the first place. Or do it twice. <laughs> do it twice and check it. Always check your answers if you can. All right, that, that should be just a bit of a rem reminder or a refresher from Physics 1 um, and an introduction to my amazing method on how to solve these problems. So let's then do a non-constant acceleration problem. More likely the case in physics and engineering. Sometimes we can approximate it as uh, constant, but can't always do it so. So imagine we have two charged plates. Though, everybody in Physics 3 now? A couple, couple aren't, but will be soon. That's when you do um, electrostatics and electrodynamics. So we have a charged plate which sets up a magnetic field between those plates. We're not going to belabor the physics of that. We have a charge, uh, two charge plates 200 millimeters apart. And suspended between them is a little metal particle right in the center at 100 millimeters. So that's its uh, that's its location at uh, at the uh, start of the problem. Now, as most of you will learn. The uh, particle will then have a position dependent acceleration. We'll say that it's down. It depends on the charge of the plates. Again, we're not the, worrying about the details of the magnet electromagnetics. And in this case, the acceleration is a function of position. It goes something like 4s meters per second square, squared, where S is the position. Measured from the top. So starting from rest, right there in the center, we then release it, it's subject to that acceleration I'd like you to find the velocity at the bottom plate. With what speed will it hit the bottom plate? Suspended and then just like drops, so it's 
Well, it's not suspended. Or like you're, you're reaching in there and holding it. Right. Okay, and then you just let it go. Okay. So, I'm just trying to figure out what the initial, what the initial velocity is zero. Yeah, initial velocity is zero. So we'll write that down. Remember, uh, uh, life is is a word problem, and from that you need to get the equations, the concepts, the mathematics all put together to solve it. Did you say it starts in the center or at the top plate? No, it starts in the center, okay. right there, point one. We want to find with which, with what speed it hits the bottom. In fact, we'll, we'll uh, how late do we, do we go to 12.35, I think? Okay, so it's too early for a get out of class question. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bob, you've got to be careful with what you say just as much as I do. <laughs> because while the administration may see what I say, I can always show your parents what you say. Or maybe your, your pastor. <laughs> Alright, we talked about what we do with certain problems that are... Uh, where the acceleration is position dependent. Did we? Gave you a, a short relation for that type of problem that had four variables in it. Do we have those four variables here? What did I tell you to do for position-dependent acceleration problems? Of course you don't remember. That's why you take notes. Look in your notes. Didn't remember to write it down. That is the equation of uh, v2 squared equals v1 squared plus 2. Integral something. Integral something. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I think that would work because that came from our, uh, our, our basic relation that we had. Then we did indeed take that and integrate it to v2 squared. Well, that's what we're looking for. v1 squared equals v1 squared plus... What was it? Two. Two. Integral between S1 and S2. Of ADS. S1 and S2. So V1's given. In fact, was zero. All you need to do is that integral. And you've got the equation, the, the functional relation of the acceleration on position.
keep a, a general understanding that uh, we'll use three or four significant figures on answers?
bottom plate over 42 meters. And from that you should get what, Bob? 0.346 meters per second. Can I leave them? Yep. <laughs> sure. You can leave any time you want. <laughs> it sounded 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 nice when you brought it up. Okay. Good idea. I'm out of here. He, he, he would left his book, his calculator, and everything. He said, "That's a great idea. I'm out of here." All right. Here's the next part. Find the time it takes to do that. How much time do you have to get in there and be ready to catch it? I don't know. Should we make this a... Should we make this a, a get out of class question? Um, what's I don't want to just start something and barely get into it. We're doing fine so far. I just do it on one side. Find out how long it takes to cross that half distance between the plates. Was it important? Huh? Was it important? Mildly. You have an old lady? Is that your no. mom old lady? No. Your mother-in-law old lady? No. Your, oh, your old lady old lady. Your wife. Are you married? You're not married. No. Girlfriend. No. It was just an old lady. No. Didn't he say it was my old lady? No. I said mildly important. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about again? I like to call my old wife my little woman. The little woman. She's taller than I am. So it's funny. She laughs every time. What? What are we calculating? The time it takes to get from the top plate to the halfway point? No, it doesn't start from the top plate. It starts from here. Oh, so from the halfway point to the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll make this a get out of class question. We only got 10 minutes left. So there you go. Get out of class question. Otherwise, you're here for the weekend with me. It's happened a couple times, Frank. Right? Get out of class question, nobody answered it. You had to order pizza, sleeping bags. It was cold, they turned the heat off in the buildings. But, we do have a projector in here now, so we could watch all the seasons of Dexter. Pro Bowls. Pro Bowls on this weekend? How did I miss that? I didn't even watch the University of Oregon play in the BCS Bowl. Concerned I was. Got it already? Well, if you check with me and you're right, then you can go. See, that's what a get out of class question is. Well, you don't shout out the answer to the get out of class question. You don't say, okay, that's good, you can go. Instantly, everybody's got the answer. It's amazing how that happens. Luckily, luckily though here, you're wrong. Why'd you get that too, Gooby? Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put them up on Angel and print out another one.
Frank, DJ, Pat, I'll put the constant acceleration oh, okay. sheet that I gave all my physics ones to. So I got you.
Nothing else came to mind? What'd you try? acceleration we're trying to find the time do we have uh, do we have any kind of relationships that involve those we can also throw in of course any any velocity um, for instance uh, let's see the one I ended up using what you don't have to, but if you want to do any of the uh, of the integration that we have, this is the one I ended up integrating. But you've got to come up with uh, velocity as a function of. integral, then you will get delta t there, but you're going to need to know velocity as a function of position. But you can get that if you integrate this not up to the definite limit of that, just to a generic limit of s. You can do this integral and that will give you v2 as a function of position. Then that you can integrate here and we'll give you delta t directly. Uh, let's see, let me write it out in some. So v2 will be the square root of 2 a ds from point one, where the problem starts, up to any position s. And then, of course, want the square root of that because that's v2. That will give you the velocity as a function of position. Then that you can put into here and integrate. And that should give you. Point six five eight seconds. Now that y'all have the answer, now you can go. You should put this solution online. No, no, no. You should go try it first. Do you understand how to do this? You just you do exactly what we did before instead of putting in point 2 for the upper limit, put in S, which means you can use any final position S, because it'll make the whole thing a function of position. You'll have velocity as a function of position. Just complete this integral with that as the other lim upper limit instead of the point 2. Once you have that, then put it in here, integrate between the same limits on S, only this time we are taking it to the bottom. Give it a try, Alan. You're pretty good at the test. Most of this stuff when you put your head to it a little bit, you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs>